Josh. Um, folks, on our old agenda, it was um, TJ, but he's unable to. Excuse me. Uh, our old agenda, um, it was the the attorney, the attorney general. I'm sorry, don't mean to be so. Um, and he's unable to attend. Um, so, Josh, we have you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Chair, Person Pugh, members of the committee, Joshua Diamond, Deputy Attorney General. It is uh, my privilege and honor to be here on behalf of the Attorney General and the entire Attorney General's office, including Ella Spotswood, who is here to join us today. She is our Deputy uh, Solicitor General, uh, who, will, who is our subject matter expert and will also be providing testimony. Um, but it, as I said, it is our honor and privilege to provide testimony in support of Proposition 5 which recognizes reproductive autonomy, including abortion, as a fundamental right under the Vermont Constitution. Under current federal constitutional law, there is a recognized fundamental right to abortion. This right has been long recognized since 1973 in the case of Roe v. Wade, and has since been reaffirmed uh, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey back in the early 90s. Under federal constitutional jurisprudence. A fundamental right is one uh, that gets heightened protection against governmental intrusion under the due process clause when it is implicit in our concept of order of liberty or deeply rooted in the history and tradition of our nation. Unfortunately, given changes to the makeup of the US Supreme Court, we believe that this fundamental right, this federal fundamental right, may be at risk to either being completely reversed or certainly rolled back or substantially eroded. And we believe the Vermont Constitution, therefore, should be amended as proposed in Proposition 5 to expressly protect the fundamental right to reproductive autonomy, including abortion, because it is both implicit in this state's <coughs> concept of uh, ordered liberty and deeply rooted in our history and tradition. Vermont has long uh, had uh, no restrictions on abortion in this state, and that the decision about whether to abort a pregnancy is a private, personal one that exists between a woman and her physician, and that's the way it should remain. Proposition 5 creates a special opportunity for Vermont. Like other Vermont constitutional provisions, we have an opportunity to create protections for individual freedom and liberty that surpass the Vermont Constitution. There are a couple of examples, uh, if I may, uh, under Article 11 of our Constitution, which uh, prohibits um, or protects against unreasonable searches and seizures, already provides levels of protection uh, that exceed the federal Fourth Amendment. Under the Common Benefits Clause, under Article 7, we only need to look back to the case of Baker versus State, which famously recognized under the Common Benefits Clause that same-sex couples should be entitled to the same benefits and privileges of marriage. At that time, the federal constitution did not recognize under the Equal Protection Clause those rights. We have a, a historic opportunity in this state, and I strongly urge support and passage of Proposition 5 to protect the fundamental right to reproductive autonomy, including abortion. Uh, our office looks forward to the debate that will go forward, not only in this uh, legislature, but also before the Vermont voters, hopefully, who will decide to pass Proposition 5. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions or turn it over to our Deputy Solicitor General. Today, as we sit around this table, um, women have a fundamental right to abortion, do they not? They do, under the federal constitution. What about the Vermont constitution? One, I think, could probably interpret uh, the provisions, but to make sure that there's no ambiguity, Having this expressly recognized under the Vermont Constitution, I think is an important step to protect this fundamental right. Proposition five, as it's written, um, you you made the statement just now 
that it protects fundamental rights, including abortion. Am I right in quoting you? That is correct. What other rights might Proposition 5 protect? Well, as um, any constitutional amendment, we were trying to protect broad fundamental principles, reproductive autonomy in this case. And so, um, unlike a statute that can be amended easily <coughs> and are typically more specific, you're trying to create an enduring concept that will uh, transcend time. For example, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. The founders of this country in the First Amendment couldn't contemplate the internet, but certainly the concepts of freedom of speech apply to this new technology. So I think by using the phrase reproductive freedom, we create a principle um, that will hopefully endure over time. And if you want Ella to join you or not, that's up to you. Um, my question. Oh, okay, because I was going to ask him what does personal reproductive autonomy mean? So I thought that's what you were getting at. No? Oh, okay, sorry, never mind. That would be the next question. Sure. Sure. Okay, well, you go ahead, Tom. Um, if you would, the phrase um, shall not be denied or infringed unless justified by a compelling state interest. What does that mean? Certainly. As with many other fundamental rights, whether it be uh, those protected under the Equal Protection Clause or, let's say, the First Amendment, those rights get heightened protection, but they're not absolute protections. So in order for state to infringe on those fundamental rights, there has to be a compelling governmental interest, and that the means by which uh, those compelling governmental interests are effectuated must be done by the least restrictive means. Uh, one might be a prohibition by yelling fire in a uh, theater, a movie theater. Uh, that wouldn't be protected necessarily under the First Amendment because there's a compelling governmental interest. Um, and there are others that uh, are have that the Solicitor General can, can provide to you. Would the committee like me to um, probably? I mean, if, if you don't mind the way we ask questions, you may have prepared <laughs> remarks. But anyway, um, I think Topper would like you to to answer that as much as you can now as well. Certainly. Um, so, as I understand the question you're asking about the um, what it means to be justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means, is that right? So, oh, sorry, Elle, could you um, identify yourself? Yes, of record? course. Uh, for the record, Eleanor Spotswood, I'm the Deputy Solicitor General of the Attorney General's Office. And now I'm going to process question for the committee and everyone. Would it make sense if you have prepared remarks for you to go through these prepared remarks and then to go for questions? Or should we, what does the committee, what's the pleasure of the committee? Well, you just heard from the Assistant Attorney General? The Deputy, but yes. Same thing. Okay. Uh, I'd like, I'm not I'd sure like the Deputy <laughs> would <laughs> say yes. So, so maybe I elevated you. <laughs> I, I think Deputy is, is higher. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I'd like to, you know, after his um, remarks, Ask him about okay. certain things, okay. but I will bow to whatever the committee wants to do. I'm I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Oh, I know you are. Okay. I know you are. Um, no. As these other people, that's why we. That's have the why I'm saying. Yeah. Whatever the committee <laughs> would like to do. I I suggest that we hear everything that they have prepared in this. Okay. So just write the questions down and know that we're going to come back. So we're going to, look, we're going to let you, okay. which is which is a first in our committee. Just thought I would tell you. I am honored. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and I, I hope I'll touch on um, many of your questions in the course of uh, and speaking. Not, we'll and if not, I'm happy to answer them. You know. 
Um, so I was planning to start today by uh, sort of backing up and talking about um, the Vermont State Constitution uh, and what it does and uh, why it's important to amend it in this way. Um, particularly because I know this committee is used to dealing with statutes um, all the time and you already passed uh, H57 and so um, I would understand if, if there were some questions about, you know, why, why are we not talking about uh, Proposition 5? Um, so broadly speaking, the state constitution, like the federal constitution, uh, operates as a check on state government power. Um, Josh already mentioned the example of free speech. Um, free speech is protected by, of course, the federal constitution in the First Amendment. It's also protected by the Vermont State Constitution um, in Chapter 1, Article 13. Um, the state and federal constitutions uh, operate in essentially the same way for free speech purposes. But that's not always true. There are ways in which the state constitution is more protective than the federal constitution. Um, and one example of that is the Common Benefits Clause, which Josh also mentioned. Um, it's very similar to the federal constitution's Equal Protection Clause, uh, but it operates a little bit differently. Um, so it provides uh, special protection for same-sex relationships and um, equal educational opportunities as the freedom decision. Um, the state constitution also, uh, it does provide for its own amendment. Um, this is a process that has happened with some regularity throughout uh, Vermont's history. Um, the specific amendment provision in the Vermont constitution is in chapter two, section 72. Um, as the committee may probably know, the process starts um, every four years. Uh, and any amendment to the Vermont Constitution must be passed twice by this body uh, before the voters get to decide if, if we will actually adopt it. Um, so the Constitution is really meant to be kind of a living document. Uh, and it does, as I mentioned, happen with some frequency. So it was last amended in 2010 uh, to lower the constitutional voting age. Uh, so statutes. Um, can really be easily changed and revisited, uh, but the Constitution is obviously a lot harder to change. Um, so the Constitution tends to be where we sort of declare our basic principles of government, um, basic democratic principles, basic fundamental rights. Um, so one of the key differences that you'll note right off the bat between uh, constitutional amendments and statutes is that um, the wording of the constitutional amendment should be clear enough to convey its purpose, but flexible enough to account for changing circumstances that we may not, we may not anticipate at this time. Um, so the First Amendment example um, that Josh gave is a, is a perfect example. Um, obviously, the framers of the federal constitution uh, did not anticipate the internet, but the First Amendment still applies to the internet. So with that background in mind, um, I'd like to turn to Prop 5 specifically. Um, again, as Josh mentioned, it uh, clearly recognizes an important right that has only been recognized in the federal constitution so far and not yet in the Vermont constitution. It's not explicit anywhere in the Vermont constitution and the, and the Vermont constitution has never been interpreted uh, by our Supreme Court um, to protect uh, reproductive autonomy um, in quite this way, whereas the federal constitution has. Um, so now that we're anticipating potentially the change in the way the US Supreme Court interprets the federal constitution, uh, my understanding is that is the impetus for um, this process. Um, taking place is, you know, do we, is this important enough to Vermont to let the voters decide whether to put it into our constitution? Um, I've heard some questions about what is reproductive autonomy already. Um, and yes, I think it includes, um, or it has the potential to include some things we haven't thought about yet. Um, 
But it also is important to note that because it's sort of drawn from the uh, federal case law, um, it does encompass a basket of rights that the federal constitution, um, US Supreme Court decisions have already determined um, to be fundamental rights uh, and related to reproductive autonomy. So um, while this body has been talking a lot about abortion, uh, this right should also encompass uh, the right to choose or refuse contraception, <coughs> the right to choose or refuse sterilization, the right to become pregnant, and the right to choose an abortion. Um, so those are all uh, sort of settled in federal law as part of reproductive autonomy. They're all part of the same uh, doctrine of cases um, that the US Supreme Court has already decided um, are kind of related. And we know this because the cases rely on each other and, and cross-reference each other when talking about these rights. Um, so those are things that are absolutely included in reproductive autonomy. Obviously, abortion is the, um, the thing that uh, generates the most um, political interest. But um, contraception, sterilization, and pregnancy are all part of that as well. Um, so Prop 5 uh, prevents future state governments from restricting reproductive rights. This includes, um, unlike a statute, this includes future laws passed by the legislature. So if Prop 5 becomes part of the Constitution, it will restrict this body um, the same way that the rest of the Constitution restricts the General Assem Assembly. Um, so the same way that you can't currently pass a law restricting, you know, broadly restricting free speech. Uh, you will not be able to pass a law broadly restricting reproductive autonomy unless you can get through this uh, compelling governmental interest justified by the least restrictive means. Um, it also, like statutes, uh, would bind other branches of government, so it would bind uh, executive agencies as well, and the governor, and um, essentially no state actor could uh, restrict reproductive autonomy um, without justifying it uh, in the way that Prop 5 asks, and I will get to that in a second. Um, so some examples of things that um, most likely would not pass that uh, standard are requiring multiple doctors to approve each abortion. Um, unless you could come up with a really compelling governmental in interest in doing that, um, we probably couldn't pass a law uh, that restricted reproductive autonomy in that way. Um, imposing a gag order on providers uh, that counsel pregnant women. You know, you can't say uh, that those providers uh, wouldn't be able to counsel pregnant women about abortion. Um, restricting what insurance plans may cover for abortion care. Um, these are all certain examples of things that would most likely not pass uh, the standard set up in Prop 5. So let's talk about that standard. Um, as you probably have heard from other witnesses, uh, justified by a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means, is a term of art um, in the law. It's uh, what we refer to as strict scrutiny. Okay. It is a very high standard. Uh, it's the highest standard under which courts review any governmental action. Um, and generally speaking, the, the federal courts have uh, broken down their standards into three, um, three different levels. So strict scrutiny is the highest. Uh, it's on the uh, I don't think you said strict what? Strict scrutiny is the term. So that's the highest standard under which courts will review a government action. Um, generally speaking, uh, courts use that standard when they are uh, analyzing any state action, any law, any regulation um, that they think infringes a fundamental right um, or categorizes people uh, who are in suspect classes, like race. Um, so you can't pass laws that, you know, uh, 
categorize uh, people based on their race uh, without having a compelling state interest justified by the least restrictive means. Um, lower than strict scrutiny is intermediate scrutiny. Um, that requires only an important governmental interest, uh, which is substantially related um, to the means of, um, that the law uses. And then the lowest standard is rational basis review. Um, and that's what most laws get if they're challenged under the Constitution um, and they don't you know, infringe on uh, fundamental rights. Um, so strict scrutiny is the standard that the court used in Roe versus Wade. Um, so this proposition would uh, essentially enshrine into Vermont law the scheme that the US Supreme Court decided in Roe versus Wade. Um, you may have heard that after Roe versus Wade, the court uh, drifted away from strict scrutiny a little bit. Um, it now analyzes reproductive rights uh, under a undue burden standard, which is sort of a, it's a little bit different from um, the other uh, standards of scrutiny that the, the court has used. But when it first decided to reverse its weight, it said, this is a fundamental right and it gets strict scrutiny. And that was the scheme that we had in place for two decades uh, before the court went back in um, Planned Parenthood versus Casey and decided, oh, we can give it this undue burden standard, which is a little lower. Uh, but for two decades, we did have strict scrutiny under Roe versus Wade. Um, notably, in that time, uh, courts did still uphold laws that restricted abortion under the strict scrutiny standard. Uh, courts particularly upheld laws uh, that restricted abortion in the third trimester uh, and later in pregnancy uh, because it found that there were, or the courts, uh, these are not Supreme Court decisions, but these are lower court decisions, um, did find that there were, uh, in some cases, compelling governmental interests um, for which to do so. So strict scrutiny is not absolute. Uh, the state can absolutely still infringe on um, a fundamental right if it can justify its action properly. It is a high bar. Um, the burden is on the government to justify its law. Um, the law is presumptively invalid, uh, but it's not fatal to the law. Um, so actually studies show analyzing decisions of all um, different courts that have analyzed uh, laws under strict scrutiny, um, studies show that approximately one in three laws will survive the strict scrutiny challenge. Um, so about 30% of laws that are challenged under the strict scrutiny standard actually are upheld by courts. Um, so I have a couple of examples. Um, free speech. Uh, is generally something protected by the First Amendment um, under a strict scrutiny standard. Right? That's, that's a very important right in America. We give it the highest standard. Um, but uh, the US Supreme Court has found that some regulations on sexually explicit speech may be upheld by a uh, compelling governmental interest in protecting the physical and psychological well-being of minors uh, by shielding them from the influence of literature that is not obscene by adult standards, but uh, could be seen as inappropriate for children. Um, that was from a case that involved a telemarketing scheme for porn. Um, and the court said, you know, there is a governmental interest, compelling governmental interest, in uh, shielding minors from uh, you know, having contact with this material. Um, and so the court said that some laws could be upheld under that interest. Um, other examples, uh, we do have a fundamental right to travel in America. Um, that is a right that gets strict scrutiny. Uh, but courts have um, still upheld certain juvenile curfew laws, again, under an interest in protecting minors, um, and some restrictions on traveling in national lands uh, based on a, an environmental interest. Um, those resources. Um, 
I already mentioned that any law drawing a race-based classification gets strict scrutiny. Uh, some affirmative action policies have been upheld uh, with the compelling governmental interest in remediating prior discrimination. Um, so again, it's strict, but it's not absolute. Um, and there are certainly examples, many examples, um, where courts have upheld laws under the strict scrutiny standard. We're holding questions until I know it's not a usual process, so we're going to write it down. Okay. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, there are some things that Proposition 5 does not do, um, which I've heard some questions about uh, throughout this process. It does not require any private health care uh, practitioner to provide any particular service, including abortion. Um, it does not restrict the state from regulating health care providers uh, broadly or um, licensing providers to make sure that they're practicing safely. Um, it does not require any private individuals to undergo any medical procedures. Um, and it doesn't change parental obligations after birth. Um, so I've heard some assertions about um, how Prop 5 would uh, change the child support laws uh, in Vermont, and um, the AG's office uh, absolutely does not believe that's true. Um, this is about the reproductive choices that one makes uh, well before birth, um, and it's only after birth that those child support laws uh, can get to effect. So, um, that is the bulk of my prepared remarks, and I am happy to take your questions. Take it away, Topper. What does Proposition 5 do? Uh, it protects a fundamental right to personal reproductive autonomy, um, and it uh, enshrines in the Vermont Constitution the rights that have already been found under the federal Constitution. And um, in, in Article 22, the phrase, uh, the personal reproductive autonomy is central to liberty and dignity to determine one's own life's course. What does that mean? So uh, these are all, Ledge Council has done a wonderful job um, in crafting this amendment. Um, these are all words and phrases that have been drawn from US Supreme Court decisions about reproductive autonomy. Um, so, I don't know if she's provided this to you yet. I believe it's in the record. Um, but there is an annotated and footnoted version of this um, that tells you exactly which Supreme Court cases these words have come from. Um, and they're all uh, familiar to me, certainly, um, having looked into this area of law. But Roe versus Wade is one of them. Uh, Planned Parenthood versus Casey is another. Um, Eisenstadt v. Baird and Gonzales v. Carhart, those are cases involving um, the right to access contraception. Um, so these words have a long history, um, and that's a history that the court would look to when it's interpreting uh, Article 22. So as I said in my remarks, um, personal reproductive autonomy involves uh, the right to contraception, sterilization, pregnancy, and abortion. We know those things from the US Supreme Court case law that um, gave us these words. Uh, and the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life course uh, similarly um, comes from the same set of cases. So a question that keeps coming up here is, is that separate from reproductive autonomy? Does that make broader? Um, central to the liberty and dignity to determine one's own life. Is that, um, does that extend from right to personal reproductive autonomy? There seems to be it, a question as to whether or not that is more um, expansive than what you just said in terms of personal reproductive autonomy. It does not expand Article 22. So the right protected by Article 22 is the right to personal reproductive autonomy. 
what those subsequent words do is add context. Um, it says re personal reproductive autonomy is, is uh, situated in the concept of uh, the ability to determine one's own life course. That's, that's why this right is important. But it doesn't um, create a larger right. Um, and you can see that in the sentence structure. It says an individual right to personal reproductive autonomy uh, is part of this concept, uh, but it's the right to personal reproductive autonomy that shall not be infringed um, by the uh, unless justified, et cetera. Uh, I want to go back to uh, Donna. You made this statement. Uh, fundamental rights including abortion. Correct. What are the fundamental rights that you're talking about? The ones that the Solicitor General recognized to access to contraception, sterilization, and pregnancy. Would it include, in Vermont we have a law that says if I choose um, to end my life, there's a, there's a path for me to take. Is that a fundamental right that I have? I think that is a fundamental right that's contemplated by Article 22. I'm, 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 I'm thinking ahead of a, a judge sitting there, and uh, this thing here says that I have a, a right <coughs> to determine my own life's course. I'm not prepared to speculate today about what our Supreme Court might do on that particular issue. But what Article 22 addresses is the personal reproductive autonomy, which is part of this concept of implicit liberty to determine one's own life's course. That we, that we recognize, that we all have a natural right, if you will, to um, grow as individuals and choose our life path. There are restrictions, but this Article 22 is focused on reproductive uh, autonomy. <coughs> as one of them. If we can go back to the question of is liberty central to the liberty and dignity to, we go back to determine one's own life course. And there is a concern being expressed by members of the committee that that, 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 that is, is more than personal reproductive autonomy, but this, this constitutional amendment doesn't address the scope of those broader concepts. It's limited to... Can you explain that, how it doesn't? I, if I could jump in. Um, there are, so... There are ways in which the Constitution um, sets out some broad strokes uh, about values, um, which are not necessarily the same as rights. It also sets out rights. Um, but in doing so, it talks about values. So um, I was looking for, I can't find it in my pile of notes, but um, I was looking for Article 1 uh, to the Vermont Constitution is a great example. Um, and in Article 1, it talks about uh, the right to, or I don't actually think use the word right, but um, yes, thank you. I, I now have many options. We're all very Here we go. <laughs> that all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable, unalienable rights. Um, that is a phrase that does not set out any explicit rights, but recognizes um, freedom, equality, and independence. Um, and that phrase provides context to the rest of the Constitution that comes after it. Um, the Vermont Supreme Court has actually found that Article One is not what we call self-executing. Um, so it does not provide uh, any particular rights that anyone can sue to enforce um, in Vermont. It just provides context for the rest of the Constitution. Um, in the same way, the text of Proposal 5 sets out a right. It's the right to 
uh, personal reproductive autonomy and says this right is situated in this larger context of dignity uh, and liberty. If I have this right. Yes. Um, and dignity and liberty are recurring themes in the Constitution. Um, but we know from the way, as I explained earlier, we know from the way that the article is put together, it sets out the right, it says this is part of liberty and, and dignity, um, and then it sets out the standard under which the right is analyzed. Um, so the, the liberty and dignity language is, is adding context, but it's not adding rights, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm going to get beyond that. I want, to, I want to go to the point, um, say, four years from now, and Proposition 5 has gone through the whole process, and it is now, in fact, in our Constitution. And um, I uh, go, uh, I, I have an unwanted pregnancy, and I am in my 26th week. Or further reading. And I go to the University of Vermont Medical Center and seeking an abortion. And the people at the University of Vermont Medical Center, the doctors say, okay, there's certain criteria that have to be followed um, to have this abortion. And I'll meet that criteria. University of Vermont still does the abortion in the medical center. Are you going to prosecute them? No. They infringed. Well, I thought that you said that the rights of the woman could not be infringed upon. Let me make sure. They're infringed upon now. I mean, they, they, they wouldn't provide the abortion. They wouldn't provide the abortion. They wouldn't provide Thank it. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> so the women's rights are infringed upon. Uh, no. Um, Proposition 5 does not require that any particular provider provide an abortion. Uh, it says that the state uh, can't take state action to restrict this right. Um, but it does not say uh, that, you know, any any doctor that you go to needs to provide this this service. Okay. The, the doctor does provide. The abortion takes place. I, I'm trying to let me get this thing straight. The fact that the doctor is saying to me, you have to pass this test. We've we've had testimony that at the, at the medical center, if you're beyond a certain number of weeks, there's an extensive uh, uh, procedure that you have to go through to have that abortion, dealing with your health and certain other things. Is that not restricting a woman's right to have an abortion? Those are, as I understand it, criteria that uh, the health profession has adopted uh, around this procedure. Those are not state laws or state policies or um, anything that could be challenged under Proposition 5. The, the state constitution yeah. operates as a check on state power. Um, so if this body passed a law that said you can't have an abortion after 26 weeks unless you meet A, B, C, and D. A, B, C, and D would have to be justified by a compelling state interest. But if you go to your doctor and say, you know, I want this procedure, there's nothing that will stop the doctor from saying, okay, let me make sure you meet all the criteria so that I can do this safely in my office. Okay, then you need to explain to me what it means when you say you cannot restrict the rights the, the, the way the law that we pass out of this committee, it's unrestricted. This Proposition 5, to me, is the same thing. It's quite similar. Um, so so I, I need to, I, you need to explain to me, what does it mean when you say legally mm -hmm. 
what does it mean when you say you cannot restrict a woman's right to have an abortion? Because I'm the doctor and I'm saying you can't have it unless you pass these criteria. That seems to me that that doctor is restricting my rights. The state constitution only binds state actors. State what? State actors. So that includes the legislature, uh, executive agencies, the governor, um, the state acting as an employer. It does not include private doctor's offices. OK. So if I, I sue the doctor, I don't win? No. Because the doctor, the doctor <coughs> is not bound by the state constitution in the same way that the government is bound by the state constitution. I thought the state constitution was the law of the land. It is the law of the land. So, so if it's in the constitution, the citizens aren't bound by it. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, so let me go back to the example of free speech. I think that's a, um, that's a pretty good analogy. Okay. So under the First Amendment, the government can't restrict our speech rights. However, private parties can. Okay. So if you walk into your doctor's office and start cursing out your doctor, they can say, get out of here. Um, I don't like what you're saying. You can't say that here. You need to leave. Yeah. Um, but as you all know, uh, protesters can, can and do come into this building and say all kinds of things. And you can't stop them uh, because you are bound by the First Amendment. That's because it's a constitutional provision, and the Constitution primarily acts as a check on state power, not as a check on private power. So in the same way, because this is a constitutional provision, this acts as a check on your power to restrict abortion, but it does not act as a check on private doctors' power to choose to provide uh, any particular service. Does that help? Makes my way I'm thinking a lot more solid. Great. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> well, it's not the way you think it is, I'll tell you that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Carl. This is a hypothetical thing, but let's say a, a future legislature brought forward a, a Proposition 10, which essentially enshrines the fact that uh, human life uh, is a viable child at, uh, let's say, 26 weeks, all right? And would that, what infringement or uh, conflict would that raise with Proposition 5? In other words, all of a sudden you have, there is another individual involved in the situation at a certain point in time. So at that point of intersection, which proposition takes, takes effect? So, um, so once you have, um, as I understand your question, this is a future constitutional amendment to protect right. the bullet in the gut. Um, so once that is also in the Constitution, now you have um, sort of equally important, uh, you know, the, the government and the people have said these are both fundamental rights. Um, and once that happens, uh, it's sort of up to the courts to decide uh, which is more important. Um, some of the things the court might look at are, um, you know, which is more specific to the situation. Um, so in your example, that might be the, uh, the second hypothetical amendment that you um, posited. Uh, it would look at um, which came later in time. That might be important. Uh, it would look at the uh, context surrounding, um, you know, what the intent of each amendment was. Um, so, you know, I couldn't say for sure what a judge would do, but those are all things that uh, the court would look at. So, to ask a simpler question, 
Is there anything that would prevent, if it was, the will of the legislature to introduce um, an amendment such as defining when life begins? No, absolutely not. Follow up to that. And what about a change in statute? In other words, the bill that was introduced, uh, uh, you know, in a future legislation that miraculously passed that the process okay, that uh, essentially recognized uh, a person at 26 weeks of life. So, would Proposition 5 prevent that statute from becoming law? It would depend on the uh, specifics of the statute. Um, so the answer is probably, but not necessarily. Um, and my answer is based in large part on um, what courts found after Roe versus Wade was passed. And Roe versus Wade did put strict scrutiny into the law, um, and future courts under Roe versus Wade did find that in some cases uh, legislatures were justified in restricting uh, abortions later in pregnancy. So, uh, you know, this body, if it were to want to pass such a statute, would want to make a very clear record of what the compelling governmental interest was. Um, it would want to make sure that the law was uh, very narrowly tailored to that interest. Um, and, you know, if it was able to do that, uh, the court would look at those things um, in deciding whether the law held up or not. So, so again, simple. And then go back. Yes. The legislature could craft a law. Yes. And it would be the law. And unless it someone someone would have to bring um, a court case, a Correct. challenge to that law. Yes. Yes. And then the court would decide. And then the court would decide whether or not. Yes. So um, I really appreciate the examples you've given. Um, it, and I'm trying in this context to get a sense of what a compelling state interest we mm -hmm. use the examples of free speech and other, but I, I'm still hesitant to even think about what, and I'm not asking you to create something out of thin air, but if you can provide a sense of what a compelling state interest, that highest level of scrutiny mm -hmm. could potentially be. Um, yeah, yeah, so um, I was thinking that too. Uh, so in the context of Roe versus Wade, um, you know, the court said, okay, abortion is part of this fundamental right, uh, and um, it gets strict scrutiny. But the court said uh, the government's interest in restricting this right changes um, based on the trimester. So in the first trimester, the court said there was really no governmental interest. At that stage, abortion was more um, safer than childbirth, et cetera, et cetera, no governmental interest. Um, in the second trimester, I'm trying to remember the exact words, there was a slightly higher governmental interest in protecting the um, health and welfare of um, the mother and child. And in the third trimester, there was a compelling state interest in protecting, um, I think, the life of the unborn child, as police reports said. Um, and so the laws that were upheld after that uh, tended to be in that sort of third trimester range, in some cases in a post viability range. Um, is that helpful in yeah. this context? Yeah. So that's, that's kind of what we're talking about with that terminology. Yeah. And it's important to remember, too, that um, any law uh, that would be, you know, Examined under the strict scrutiny standard needs not only to have a compelling state interest, but also to be narrowly tailored. So you could say the government has a compelling state interest in protecting life in the third trimester, but if your law banned abortion after five weeks, that's not narrowly tailored to the third trimester. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
So in terms of Roe versus Wade, since we've been talking about that, um, this particular uh, Proposition 5 allows for unrestricted abortion, doesn't it? Uh, it protects abortion rights and others from um, laws restricting them without certain justifications. It's not, uh, I wouldn't, I hesitate to call it unrestricted because there are ways in which the government could subsequently restrict it. Does that make sense? Um, Roe versus Wade, let's go yes. back to that. Okay. And that's pretty specific, isn't it? Even with KC and et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is it not? Yeah. Is it restrictive after a certain number of weeks? Uh, Roe versus Wade itself did not create any restrictions. It allows the state. Okay. It allows the state if they choose to. It, it allows um, for certain restrictions by the state, yeah. Right. Yeah. And that was the same framework as Proposition 5. So Roe versus Wade said, Abortion laws get strict scrutiny. Proposition 5 says abortion laws This is why I wanted a judge to come in here. We can talk to a lawyer all day long, but a judge has to make that decision. Um, I have one more question. You talked about um, the government, the legislature, couldn't get, in, couldn't, um, get involved with that UVM situation that I, I brought up. What if the University of Vermont but state money. Would it be then considered a state entity? Uh, just getting state funding does not make you a state entity. There are lots of health centers that get state funding, um, but they are not all state actors. Um, there's a specific test, which I don't have at my fingertips for what makes you a state actor, but it's a, it's a high bar. Absolutely. Um, you keep going back and forth between if the law doesn't say, 
and Proposition 5. There is no law. Correct. Right now, before us, we have Proposition 5. And we have a bill that we passed in this, it's in another section of this building. Um, so I think the question was given based on Proposition 5. Right. So Proposition 5 is a restriction on future laws, which is what I keep saying the law doesn't say. So Proposition 5 prevents you from passing future laws that will restrict abortion rights, among other things. So what are the other things? Uh, contraception, sterilization, Just those, those things. nothing else. Uh, it, again, in the future, something might come up, but those are the ones that I um, am certain are under the under the provision. Okay. No vote is necessary. This is why we are here. This is why you know we are you know giving the time for people to ask the questions and try to get clear. Um, try to un try to get clear for themselves where we individually sit related to this question, which will be first before the committee. Do we move this um, out of committee um, onto the floor and let the full body? <coughs> It seems to me that a compelling state interest is the right to life. So I think it's very likely some proposition like this will come before the courts in the relatively near future. So it just it would seem like that would be a compelling interest to write if somebody said uh, a, a fetus has a right to life at a certain point, like 26 weeks, just to pick it out of that. It seemed like that would be an example of a very strong compelling state of Is that correct? Uh, under the Roe versus Wade framework, um, some laws have been justified by that uh, in the third trimester. Uh, other questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Super Oh, um, if you happen to have written remarks um, that are, um, I mean, you'd love to have them submitted. 